Coming up, a new toolkit provides resources for trans and two-spirit Indigenous youth. We look at a new documentary on nurses and what would an overturn of Roe mean for Indigenous communities and abortion rights? We find out. I am Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Ko'otzi hopa. Thank you for joining us. We begin in Washington, D.C., where the Biden administration is awarding millions of dollars to help expand Internet access for dozens of tribes. The Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications and Information Administration made the announcement last week. The nearly $77 million in awarded grants is part of the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program. These funds cover Internet use and adoption projects to upgrade things like health care, education, and social services. The Gila River Indian community says it will be using its funds to expand telehealth and distance learning opportunities. To date, the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program has issued 33 awards, totaling more than $83 million in funding. In Maine, a few pieces of legislation are working with and against tribal nations. Last week, the state's governor, Janet Mills, signed a new law that legalized sports betting in the state. Tribes now have the exclusive right to online wagering, and existing casinos can only conduct in-person betting. While tribal nations praised this legislation as a win, they said they also felt short on another bill. Currently, federally recognized tribes in Maine are treated like municipalities, which means they are subject to state law. A new sovereignty bill aimed to allow federally recognized tribes to be treated like others in other states. But that law stalled after the state legislature did not make a final action. Despite the no action, the state's governor said she will veto that bill if it lands on her desk. Leaders from the Wabanaki tribe said they will continue moving forward in their quest for permanent sovereignty. In Oklahoma, Tulsa police officers are searching for information in the case of a missing statue. The statue was made of bronze and it depicted Osage prima ballerina Marjorie Tallchief. The statue stood on the grounds of the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum for nearly 15 years when it was stolen at the end of April. Parts of the statue were recovered in early May at a recycling center just outside of Tulsa. Those who stole the statue are reported to have received around $250 for the copper-rich bronze, according to reporting by the Osage News. This isn't the first time a sculpture of an Osage woman was stolen. Last year, a 7-foot, 400-pound bronze statue of an Osage woman was stolen in Kansas City and sold for scrap. Those with information are asked to call Tulsa police. The Senate's Human Rights Committee continued its hearings last week on the forced and coerced sterilization of persons in Canada. Testimony was heard from Indigenous women who were sterilized against their will. Other witnesses shared similar horrific stories spotlighting the lack of autonomy Indigenous females have for their own bodies. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. There are no words to describe the violation and powerlessness of having your cultural identity as a woman essentially sterilized. This terrifying experience left a void inside of me. I felt no longer a woman, and I am terrified of hospitals and doctors. I didn't say anything to anybody because I thought no one would believe me. I felt empty with my maternal instinct and God-given ability to bear life cut and ripped from me. These are just a few snapshots of the horrific stories shared by Indigenous women who were forced into sterilization against their will by hospital staff and social services workers. The woman told the Senate committee the sterilization was done without consultation or choice, 
usually just after they had given birth and were most vulnerable, with scars lasting a lifetime. Witness Morningstar Mercury told the committee countless Indigenous people have been subject to forced sterilization for generations. It is my opinion that we will never adequately be able to determine the numbers of women and men, girls and boys, that were sterilized in residential schools and in Indian hospitals. Senator Kim Pate said the story she heard meet the test for criminal prosecution. In this case, my uh, hearing of what you've described already violated criminal law. You were assaulted. You were sexually assaulted. It was also contrary to the medical codes of the doctors and nurses, the, all the medical professionals. It violated your human rights. And yet there's been no accountability. The 2021 Senate report recommended a House of Commons committee further study this issue with the goal of finding solutions to stop the practice. Praiser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, why is gender-affirming care important for two-spirit youth? One physician shares more. We'll be right back. Native youth face barriers to accessing quality health care, and those barriers are even more present for transgender and two-spirit youth. Medical professionals around the country are now talking about the benefits to gender-affirming care. That is, when a doctor gives individualized care to a patient in a judgment-free way. Joining us today is Alessandra Angelino. She is the co-author of the online resource toolkit called Celebrating Our Magic. It is for Indigenous, trans, and two-spirit youth. Hi, Alessandra. Thanks for joining us. Let's just jump right in here. How did this toolkit start? When I was out in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in Washington, uh, working with Seattle Children's Hospital, we were talking with a lot of the local tribal health clinics and asking the providers, but also youth, what they felt was something missing in the community. Um, and Around that time, there was a lot of work with non-Native youth in terms of gender-affirming care, but there was a huge gap in that care for Native youth in particular. And so um, we first just started off just talking to community members and seeing what their interests were and gathering stories and uh, learning more about the history of the specific tribes and then realized that there was a lot of interest across the U.S. as we got connected with folks from the Indian Health Service and different tribal health centers. Um, and so talking to youth across the country and talking to a lot of the leaders working with the Indian Health Service, we were able to compile stories into this toolkit. Uh, and the main purpose of the toolkit was really for youth, their parents, and then also for healthcare providers and compiling resources for them. Um, so that was the main goals, um, but the other big one was to create something that was culturally grounded, since, as I'm, I'm sure you've seen, there's a lot of resources generally for gender diverse folks, but not for Native youth who identify as Two-Spirit or LGBTQ. Absolutely. Do you have any tips for Indigenous youth who are wanting to talk about gender? What advice do you have for them to advocate for themselves? I think Sometimes it's hard to talk to others at first if youth are thinking through how they're feeling and they might not have the language or the words to express that yet. And so using resources like the Celebrating Our Magic Toolkit or looking online at some of the resources through the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board um, and Healthy Native Youth, those really have great tips in terms of, you know, just how to express yourself. Um, but I think in general, if you are able to find just one person that they're able to connect with and talk to, uh, that's really important. I think in spaces where youth might not feel safe to talk with someone in their family or their healthcare provider, or even someone at school, 
through there are opportunities through uh, you know social media, and then some of those organizations that I mentioned previously to connect with other individuals with the same identity. As a trusted adult in a young person's life, what are ways to support Indigenous youth who want to have conversations about gender? I think. First, just again, educating themselves if this is something that's a new topic. So using the native centric resources and then again, reconnecting to history. I know, you know, especially in the Pacific Northwest when we were having these discussions, not everyone is, is you know, has that privilege of knowing about their history just because of all the traumas and um, boarding schools and things like that. but trying to connect back with resources and stories that are available. Um, and then again, just really focusing on the main idea that is support and allyship and just celebration of your child or the, the child you're caring for will go a long way. And similar to that, I think um, thinking through just identity as like a puzzle piece and recognizing that yes, this child has come to you saying that they're two spirit or they're gender diverse, but that's not the only part of their identity that matters. They're also a soccer player or a um, dancer, they're a brother, they're a sister. And so all facets of this child's identity is important. And as a adult that they're choosing to trust, you can make a really big difference in supporting them and saving their life, to be completely honest. Like this is one of the the realms I feel in my job as a pediatrician, where if I support a child when they tell me I'm gay or I'm two-spirit, that I can prevent them from harming themselves and going through those cycles of trauma again and depression and prevent a suicide, which is, is something that's really important. A large part of this toolkit talks about the benefits of an Indigenous two-spirit individual who is seeking care in a culturally appropriate way. What are the existing options for these youth to see a doctor or a healthcare provider who is understanding of Indigenous values? I think there are, if you go on the Indian Health Service website under their uh, two-spirit and LGBTQ section, there are lists of providers who are practicing gender affirming care. I think there's still a lot to be done in terms of getting the names of folks who are two-spirit and LGBTQ friendly in Indian communities out in the world. But I think generally uh, in pediatric clinics and health clinics, there's been a lot of progress um, promoted through the Indian Health Service and other organizations to really educate all providers about how to be gender affirming. Um, yeah. Alessandra, you've taught me so much today. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Nurses are integral to the care of a patient. One of them is Whitney Fear, a psychi psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Who Cares? A Nurse's Fight for Equity is part of a project called SHIFT. It's a community of nurses ready to make a positive change for each other and for the profession. The project is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Whitney takes a holistic and trauma-informed approach to helping individuals with behavioral health issues and substance abuse disorders. From the Oglala Lakota Nation, Whitney works in Fargo, North Dakota. Let's take a look at the documentary's trailer. If you own a pair of Crocs, even though you know they're super ugly, you might be a nurse. <laughs> I'm Whitney Fear. I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner in Fargo, North Dakota. I'm Lakota. I grew up in the country on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I see patients across the lifespan for treatment of mental health conditions and substance use disorders. I don't think she's ever given herself enough credit for the impact that she makes on other people. Yeah, she's tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> she is going to have vulnerable conversations with people in a way that makes them feel like they're cared for. I always say it's the essence of Whitney. You have to just understand how really good she is. 
asking people how they want their care and what they think is possible because that is communicative of respect rather than compliance. Riding in my Indian car. Welcome to the ICT Newscast, Whitney. Thank you, and thank you for having me. So tell us about this film and how it got started. Uh, so the, um, the very abridged version of that is that uh, I agreed to be a part of the, the podcast. I recorded an episode of the podcast with the SHIFT team uh, last year. And from that, the, the conversations building up to the podcast, then after um, they had indicated that they were interested in, in trying to branch out into film and they asked if I would be interested in um, being a part of that. And um, I had said yes, that I, I would be for sure. So I think um, yeah, that we, the facility I work for and the approach in the community is a pretty unique. And um, so that was kind of how that, that got together. What are some of the challenges that your patients face in recovery? Uh, there's, you know, there's many, um, you know, it can be recovery can be really lonely. Um, you know, I speak to that from the perspective of behavioral health professional and as a person in recovery for myself and recovery from alcohol. And um, it, you, you really have to change your whole social circle um, because there is still going to be a lot of people around you that are, you know, that you used to spend time with that are, are still using and that's something that can be detrimental to, <clears throat> to your own recovery. Um, and also, you know, the, um, whenever people enter recovery and they, they still have a lot of stressors going on, which is, you know, often the case, trying to put into place like alternative ways of coping with things be, because our brain is so, um, you know, gets really fixated on, on, you know, well, you know, it, it, has us thinking, well, maybe we should just go back to that other way of doing things because it's faster. Um, and so that that pattern can be really difficult to break out of. And um, especially if it's a pattern that uh, people have observed from the time they were kids and, and their parents or grandparents or adults around them. And, and again, if they have peer pressure, um, societal pressure is a, you know, a big one, I would say, something we kind of tried to highlight with the documentary and then and afterward is that it, you know the widest used substance in the state of North Dakota is alcohol um, and there's a, a big societal acceptance of alcohol in in the state of North Dakota as well so it you know it can be something I've seen a lot of patients uh, struggle with their families and, and loved ones taking their alcoholism seriously when they say I have a problem I need to not drink anymore oh no you don't it's you know, you can control it. You can still have drinks with us and things like that. So um, <clears throat> that's something that it's it's difficult for a person to get to a point of admitting that that something um, is you know they, the, that difficult relationship with a substance. And if that acceptance is being met with a message of like, no, you don't have a problem, it can be that can be difficult too. Can you talk about what resources are available specifically for Native people in terms of trying to recover? Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, um, as is the case in, in many areas in the United States, there there aren't many culturally specific resources for Indigenous people in, in North Dakota. Um, and again, that's not, that's not unusual nationwide. Um, there, there's some great programs out there. Um, it's just kind of putting them into place and getting them going, um, such as Well Variety is a great, great resource. And um, really awesome approach, but yeah, getting um, getting funding for things like that and getting them going is being really difficult. Um, and it's unfortunate that things like that hinge on financial, you know, things, but that is real, you know, realistic to, to consider whenever wondering, you know, about putting things like that into place. So unfortunately, there's, there's not many Shift is a project that supports nurses and uh, their mental health. Maybe talk about that. Yeah, so it you know Shift, um, I think is it, you know something that you know for as nurses and and well and healthcare providers in general too. It can be the, it can be really difficult for us to talk about the stress of, of the job and what we encounter with um, family and friends because it, it can be hard for them to understand. It can um, 
it can feel like, oh man, how would I even like tell somebody about my day? Um, this is going to make them sad or, <laughs> um, you know, be difficult for them to hear some of the things that go on. And uh, it's so that peer support like that, like platforms like Shift are, are really helpful as you definitely know there's going to be somebody who knows what gets what you're saying, gets what you're talking about. Well, Whitney, thank you so very much for being here today. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. Last week, a draft opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court was leaked. It showed that the high court had internally voted in favor of overturning the landmark decision in Roe v. Wade. The court has not released an official ruling on the case and is expected to in early June or late July. ICT's political correspondent, Polly Dinetclaw, has been covering this story, and she joins us now for more. Welcome back to the newscast, Polly. Thank you so much for having me, Alia. On a high level, tell us what this opinion means for abortion rights. So at a high level, this really challenges the foundational legislate, the foundational cases that really secure a woman's right to choose. And um, essentially, it would mean, at least from my understanding, that states would have the authority to say whether or not an abortion could be criminalized, banned, um, or even just not happen at all. Yes. So what the Supreme Court might do is they're going to allow the courts, uh, the states to decide for themselves whether or not they want to allow abortions. And so they're giving this decision to states, but in places like Oklahoma and Texas, we know that this can be very challenging um, for abortion rights in those areas. You spoke to Indigenous folks shortly after this opinion was leaked. Um, What did they have to say? I spoke to a lot of Indigenous organizers in New Mexico and Oklahoma, and one of the things that they continuously brought up besides the fact that there are these challenges, obviously, to Roe v. Wade, that it is a very uncertain time. They were not surprised by the decision that the Supreme Court was making. They had assumed that this is the direction that the Supreme Court would go. And one of the things that was most concerning to them, along with Roe v. Wade, is the Hyde Amendment. They continuously talked about the Hyde Amendment and how it impacts specifically Indigenous women and their access to abortion care. And so one of the things that they would like to see is, yes, talk about Roe v. Wade, but also let's talk about the Hyde Amendment and some of the impacts that that has on women's health. And actually tell us more about what the Hyde Amendment means for um, people wanting to receive care from federally run facilities. Yes, so the Hyde Amendment really... So the Hyde Amendment doesn't allow for federal dollars to be used for any type of abortion care. And so that means that Indian Health Services, uh, Medicaid, those federal programs that do provide health care are not able to use any funding for abortion care of any kind. And so this deeply impacted Indigenous women who often rely on Indian Health Services and federal dollars for health care. And even though the Hyde Amendment has very specific cases where abortions can be performed, um, that includes, you know, instances of incest, rape, um, or also uh, the life of the mother is in, in danger, then those are the cases where abortions can be provided. But unfortunately, Uh, There is research and just information from the organizers who have gone to these facilities that that's not happening. You know, what really struck me about your story is that um, you outlined the history of Indigenous women who have already had barriers to their right to choose whether or not to have children. Tell us about that. Yes. So really, the folks that I talked to wanted to emphasize that the issue surrounding women's health, indigenous women's health, um, has happened before even Roe v. Wade, before talks about abortion, 
before this country was even created, really talking about colonization and its impact on people's right to choose, on people choosing when and how they want to be parents, and also the taking of indigenous children and not allowing indigenous people to raise their children. And so this is just a really long history of people's right to bodily autonomy being challenged. I want to actually talk about um, the other side of the coin, the people who are celebrating um, this potential overturning of Roe. Tell us about those folks. Yeah, so one of the things that we saw, especially from Yvette Harrell and from uh, Representative Mark Wayne Mullen, who are both uh, from the Cherokee Nation, I believe, um, are celebrating this moment and are see it as a way of um, saving lives. I, that was one of the tweets that uh, Representative Mark Wayne Mullen said. And he, yeah, he really tweeted out that he was excited um, that this could be the possible ruling. Well, Polly, this, of course, is going to be a story that we follow. Um, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a step. Run, you got to run, you got to run.